In this video, I take a quick detour from causal modeling, and I want to talk about using directed acyclic graphs, not really for a causal model, but more to get insight in the probability distribution of the data, which is an extremely powerful technique. So in statistics, in multivariate statistics, a very common problem is that we need to have a joint likelihood function of all the data. So that is a uh, function, a program, if you will, that you put in data, and then you get how likely was it that the data occurred under a certain parameter. And then we use that function to estimate our parameters um, so that we get parameters, for example, under which the data was most likely. And we need to have a mathematical expression for this uh, joint likelihood. And joint here refers to multiple variables, so multivariate statistics, which is what we do because we have multiple pulse variables in all our networks. So that is usually written like probability of A, B, C, D, uh, any type of variables taking any type of values. Now this can be a very hard function. For example, in the Ising model, this function is um, not that hard to write down, but it's very hard to compute because we need to take a sum over all possible outcomes of all possible variables, which with more than 20 or 30 variables will take longer than the time in the universe to compute. Using DAX will make uh, expressing joint likelihoods in many cases, not in the Ising model unfortunately, but in many cases, much more simple. And this is an extremely powerful technique that is used a lot in statistics and that you might also encounter sometimes. So how is that done? First, let's talk about how do you define a uh, joint probability distribution, like for example here for five variables. One way to do that is with uh, this expression. So what we can do is we can multiply the um, probability distribution of A without knowing anything else with the probability distribution of B, given that we know A, with the probability distribution of C, given that we know A and B, with the probability distribution of D, given that we know A, B, and C, and uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And we can do it in any order. We could also start with E, and then uh, C given E, and then uh, B given C and E, et cetera. But at some point, we do need these very complicated functions. But if we know the DAG, if we know that A causes B, or we don't even need to say cause here, we can just say this is the way we describe the data. And B, um, well, let's say cause, it's easier to say, cause C. Then we know that A and C are conditionally independent given B. So that means that the probability of C given A and B is the same as the probability of C given only B. Because if we know B, A has no longer any effect on C and no longer any correlation with C. So that means that the probability distribution of C, if we already know B, doesn't matter what A is. And that makes this expression much simpler because then we can write this expression by just simply multiplying the probability of one variable um, given uh, its parents, as we can call it, or uh, its causes. So in this case here, we can say, okay, we only need um, B given A, and C given B, and D given C, and E given D. And that's much simpler, right? Because this can be a very simple function. It only has two variables in there. And we could, for example, specify, okay, this is like a logistic function of, let's say, C on B, or like a linear function or anything. We don't need more than two variables there. So that's much, much simpler. And that's a very powerful thing. So the simplest case is actually um, what you can then think of as a empty network. And this is actually something you see a lot in statistics. So we could say, okay, y1, let's say that is the scores of person one, right? So this is, say, a person, person one. And this could be the scores of person two, right? et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Then we can assume that the scores of person one have no impact on the scores of person two. And the scores of person two have no impact on the scores of person three. And this is what we uh, mean when we say that we assume that our cases are independent. 
If that is the case, then the probability of y1 doesn't depend on any of the other variables. In that case, we can simply take the product of all these probability distributions to get the probability of the full data set. And this is one of the main assumptions that you will see in statistics, or maybe if you don't see it, it is taken under the hood. Almost every statistical estimation procedure you use in psychology relies on this assumption. Um, and you can think of it as a, as a DAG, which is, is nice. Now, a setting in which we cannot assume this independence of cases is when the data is not of people, but rather of uh, points in time. So for example, uh, this could be scores the same person, but measured at like 9 o'clock, 12 o'clock, 5, 3 o'clock, etc. Then you can no longer assume that your scores are independent, because if I feel very tired at 9 o'clock, I might still feel very tired at 12 o'clock, regardless of how tired I am in general. So uh, we need a full joint likelihood distribution of all responses to actually get some parameters out there. Uh, but that's hard. It's nearly impossible to do. So what do we do? Instead, what we can do is take a lag one factorization. Right? So then we can see that, okay, the scores of uh, 12 o'clock are only dependent on the scores of one time point before, et cetera, et cetera. So then we can compute the likelihood like this, which is much easier and something we can actually do. Then in addition, usually uh, you assume that these uh, effects stay uh, equal over time, so you have stationarity, and then you get a model that you can, uh, can estimate. So if you think about this in terms of DAG, you can see that uh, we can think about this saying, okay, the scores of Y2, let's say the scores of 12 o'clock, are actually correlated with the scores of, uh, let's say, 6 o'clock, but the correlation can be explained by the scores of 3 o'clock. And so the past is independent of the future given the present. Now this idea of uh, representing statistical models as well as uh, stacks can actually be taken much, much more further. And this is what you often see, especially in Bayesian estimation. Um, many people in cognitive modeling, for example, do this, where you can actually become really creative with this and also treat parameters as variables themselves that also cause one another. Right, so you can think, for example, as a normal distribution being a function of a mean and a standard deviation. Right? So you can think of that as a DAG as well. And you can make these models even more complicated. So here's a very complicated model where we have uh, a score here, which is a function of, of theta. And theta is a function of other uh, parameters that are at a, a different level. Right? Um, so this is in people this box here, but uh, outside the box is, is no longer in people. And you can think of a really uh, very advanced hierarchical models or multi-level models that you can represent in this way. Now there's very strong uh, software like STAN or JAX that allows you to specify a model like this. And then what it does, it will construct a DAG uh, behind the, under the hood that will compute the joint likelihood of all these parameters. And with that, you get the posterior distribution, if you know Bayesian estimation. It will compute this joint likelihood using this DAG factorization. And it will actually give you output as well, like the DAG has so many nodes and things like that. So this is a very powerful way in which DAGs are used. It has almost nothing to do anymore with really thinking about it in terms of causality or network analysis, but it's nonetheless um, very useful to know.